In my Music Mythos episode devoted to Michael Jackson, I made it emphatically known that I do not believe he was ever a pedophile. Look at how Michael Jackson behaved when it was actually time for him to break the law. When he wanted to illegally anesthetize himself with propofol, he found Conrad Murray, a doctor with financial problems and a checkered past. In short, someone he could manipulate, someone he had leverage on, successfully covering his tracks quite literally until after his death in fear of the minor fine and possible community service sentence that would result from being convicted of such. But the Chandler and Arvizo families want us all to believe that when it came time for Michael Jackson to deflower a child, a crime that could put him away for the remainder of his life and ruin his entire career in the process, his master plan boiled down to, hey, hop on the bed in full view of your brother and we'll jerk each other off. I submit that given Michael's provable tactical acumen, not to mention financial resources, if he ever actually had diddled a kid, we wouldn't have ever heard one mumbling fucking word about it. The fact that there even was a trial is to me almost proof enough that Michael Jackson never inappropriately laid a hand on a kid in his life. I asserted my reasons effectively, I feel, but the time constraints involved also, I felt, made my rebuttal a cursory one by nature. I'd always intended to append those thoughts with something more in-depth and comprehensive at a later date. And then, just this past week... The story broke, providing me with just such an opportunity. Look, you've been forewarned, today's video is not primarily comedic in nature, but rather a categorical defense of Michael Jackson, a man no longer alive to defend himself. I would first, to that end, like to extend my condolences to the family of Michael Jackson, most specifically, his children, who through no fault of their own or their father's have been made to endure an onslaught of idiocy based on laughable evidence and thanks to a remorseless media with an axe to grind, one that simply will not die. You're not alone. Pun only slightly intended. Some of us do know the facts, and your father's innocence, once you look at those facts, is immutable, never weaken. We're with you in spirit, and God speed. I would be further remiss not to acknowledge attorney Tom Mesereau's tireless advocacy of Michael Jackson's innocence. It's easy to assume a celebrity defense attorney is merely in it for the Skrilla, and Tom has certainly made his. But the fact that Mr. Mesereau hasn't been employed by Jackson or his estate since 2005, yet never misses an opportunity to publicly articulate the case for his innocence in exhaustive detail more than a decade hence, is proof to me that his stance is more about principle than payola. I'm unashamed to admit that it's precisely through the promulgative efforts of Mr. Mesereau that I was first exposed to some of the more pertinent exculpatory evidence you will now be treated to. For further information on this topic, if you're interested, I cannot recommend his lectures, interviews, and writings vociferously enough. Now, before we move on with the body of today's rebuttal, we have to address the, and I employ the loosest possible interpretation of the word here, allegations that broke this past week, contending that during 2003's raid of Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch, a veritable deluge of pedo porn, some of it violent and even bestial in nature, was recovered in the process. To quote Winston Churchill, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on, and true to form before anyone had seen fit to vet this story and verify that it conforms to the facts long since committed to public record, Everyone from Jezebel.com to Breitbart News to the Huffington Post hit us with a hailstorm of horseshit. I'm not going to linger on this over much because the story's less than a week old and its efficacy has already begun to erode before our very eyes. But even a perfunctory glance at the evidence of the 2005 case reveals this to be bullshit squared. As FBI and court documents clearly show, the only article the prosecution could even vaguely construe as pedophilic was a coffee table book of art photography featuring fair-haired foundlings frolicking the fuck through dewy meadows, swimming in lakes, and other assorted stand-by-me shit. It's not only not pornographic, it's an art photography bestseller. Pretty much any asshat with a black turtleneck and a Nikon owns one. If that constitutes kitty porn, well, you better lock up that Michelangelo prick because the Sistine Chapel is a palace of pedophilia. Hell, at a certain point in the trial, the prosecution were so desperate for viable evidence, they tried to attach a Hustler magazine recovered from Michael's home with Gavin Arvizo, the 2003 accuser. His fingerprints, they argued, were found on the magazine. The problem? His fingerprints were on the magazine? Because the prosecution had taken it out of its protective bag and handed the fuck to Gavin Arvizo during pre-trial interviews. The three felonies that I observed firsthand and have firsthand knowledge of, fingerprint evidence, fabrication. 
the magazine had not been printed till four, five, six months after the I'm war. I'm sorry, Mr. Wagner, your time is up. And it was all captured on tape. You mean to tell me the prosecution were scraping the bottom of the evidentiary barrel so exquisitely goddamn hard that they went so far as to tamper with state's evidence, nearly inciting a retrial in the process, but they gave a mountain of kitty torture porn a pass? Yes, seems fucking legit review tech usa not that i expect sexual discernment from a baggy-eyed beluga so i'm probably fucking fat he couldn't pick his own cock out of a fucking lineup why don't you confine yourself to what you stick to best e-drama pedestrian opinions and your own goddamn computer chair you want to talk red flags and common sense you diabetic golem how about the red flag of none of this shit being entered into evidence so no i don't believe michael jackson was a pedophile and i've made that determination based entirely on empirical fact, mind you, something the story originally leaked by inveterate tabloid Radar Online did not traffic in whatsoever. Not one article of evidence, not one witness statement, a leaked video of the Neverland raid itself that does not show the recovery of one item of pornography, straight, gay, or otherwise, and what little horseshit and hearsay it does proffer is contradicted by publicly available FBI and Santa Maria court documents that make not one solitary mention of any cow fucking kitty porn having been recovered from Neverland Ranch. Hell, even the article in question links to another horrifically sourced article of an interview with one of Michael Jackson's many hush hush girlfriends, in which she says in no uncertain terms that he didn't own child porn, bone bitches like it was going out of style, and emphatically states that he did not fuck kids. Not only does the evidence contradict the story, the fucking story! contradicts the story. Breitbart, Jezebel, Huffington Post, and most importantly, Radar Online, you now have exactly one job. Either corroborate your claims with substantive evidence, or retract this defamatory dog shit fucking yesterday. The man is dead. He's dead largely because of his inability to deal with the unceasing barrage of bullshit, unsourced, opprobrious tripe like this. And if no one else is going to speak up in his defense, then fuck you. I'll erect the finger and do it myself. And with that, we move on to the rebuttal at large. Whereas, depending on who you ask, descriptions of the 2005 Arvizo molestation case can vacillate from he was guilty but they just couldn't prove it, to railroad job to the umpteenth power and embarrassment to the legal profession at large, public sentiment for the original allegations in 93 are about as mixed as the Aryan youth. As such, in preparing this comprehensive rebuttal of the recent spurious allegations that Michael Jackson owned gruesome child pornography, I came to one sobering realization, folks. Categorically obliterating these accusations would be impossible without focusing almost exclusively on the 1993 accuser that for some ludicrous reason everyone still largely believes in fact was molested. His name? Jordan Chandler, but sadly as we roll the fuck on here, I think you'll see the child was really a secondary accessory to a successful extortion attempt by another man, one who committed suicide just months after Jackson's death by the name of Evan Chandler. While some overzealous Jackson fans have ascribed motive to the suicide, claiming he was awash with guilt, eh. The man left no suicide note I'm aware of, so to hypothesize as to his mental state beyond being in profoundly poor taste would be an exercise in futility. And given that rampant speculation without proof is what largely got Michael Jackson in this position to begin with, I would hope his fan base would recognize the perils of perpetrating the very same against his extortionist. And make no mistake, Evan Chandler was an extortionist. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen to him. Yeah. Beyond, beyond his worst nightmares, he one more record. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. That phone call is from after Jordan Chandler was allegedly molested. Yet not one word about his son having been victimized, despite the fact that theoretically the wound would have still been fresh at that point. Instead of an indignant father, we get a rather callous, cold, and calculating assertion about Evan Chandler's plan to destroy Michael Jackson if he doesn't get, quote, what he wants. And what he wanted, folks, was Hollywood success. Evan Chandler, you see, was a dentist by trade, one with a pattern of behavior showing he had a tendency to latch onto famous figures and leech him fucking dry. 
A chance encounter with Mel Brooks, one we're still not certain wasn't engineered as a favor from Michael Jackson, would lead to Evan Chandler being the screenwriter and co-producer of Robin Hood Men in Tights. But as Michael's favors began to dry up, so did Evan Chandler's affection for the King of Pop, an adversarial relationship, one that mirrored in many respects Michael's own struggle with his domineering father developed, that led the divorce-afflicted Chandler child to turn to Michael Jackson for comfort and companionship in lieu of his biological parents. Then Evan Chandler hooked up with prosecuting attorney Larry Feldman, whose moral repute, to put it bluntly, falls somewhere between Johnny Cochran and Snidely Whiplash. And I note that many people fond of employing the term red flags in connection with Michael Jackson's interest in children fall mysteriously goddamn silent when it's pointed out that Larry Feldman consulted in both the 1993 molestation case and the 2005 case with Gavin Arvizo. That's right, both cases involve the same limber dick fucking lawyer. Motherfucker, they ain't a flag big enough or a color red enough to convey the conflict of interest there. But hey, at least the same vindictive ass district attorney pushed both cases despite a dearth of evidence and a surfeit of hearsay. Otherwise, I might actually think there was a fucking professional vendetta at play or something. Then Evan Chandler, a dentist by trade, hooked up with Jordan's stepfather, the co-conspirator, recorded on a phone call I just played earlier, and scheduled an impromptu dental exam with his son. There was a great article in GQ done by a journalist named Mary Fisher, uh, and she went back and she had proof that Evan Chandler, this man who just committed suicide, and uh, and the current husband of his wife, then, yeah. the, uh, the stepfather, yeah. uh, had conspired to create this situation, and that they actually drugged the kid in the dentist's office and got him to say things that weren't true about Michael. Oh. That's right, the original confession was elicited while Jordan Chandler was under the influence of laughing gas. Look, we will never know exactly what occurred in that dentist chair, but if you're arguing that the existence of a leading question or 17 or even outright suggestion is an Olympian leap of logic here, you are far more trusting soul than I, my friend, particularly given the menacing tone of the recorded phone calls in question. For all the talk of Neverland Ranch his creepy pedophilic undertones by the flopping flaccid dickheads in the tabloid media, it should interest you to discover that the 1993 accuser never claimed to have been molested at Neverland. He claimed rather that he was molested in Monaco. What you're about to watch is a clip from an indescribably biased documentary from 2007, rife with factual inaccuracies, whose entire premise is that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. But what it does function as is a bit of a primer for the accusations themselves. So take what you're about to watch with a grain of bullshit. The honeymoon with Jordy Chandler in Monaco was interesting on several levels because he, they traveled there for the award ceremony, the World Music Awards, but he took not only Jordy Chandler, but his mother and his sister. In very typical fashion, he gave the mother some, a credit card and said, go shopping. It was just Jordy and Michael in that room. Only Michael Jackson and Jordy can ever really know what happened in that room. But all we know for sure is that while the award ceremony continued, Jackson and Jordy remained in the suite. Having now absorbed that cyclopean dollop of disinformation, briefly plant yourself in Chester Molester's pedo pumps. You're Michael Jackson, a provably shrewd, calculating individual. You learned the moonwalk in the late 70s, yet waited nearly five years to break it the fuck out at Motown 25 for precisely the right moment to catapult you to superstardom. Through raw business acumen and cutting, you now own the two most remunerative musical catalogs in existence outside your fucking own, purchasing half of Sony Music Publishing in the process. While you may not be a pedophile, you've certainly committed lesser crimes in the past. Doctor shopping, illicit and prescription drugs, addiction, yet you were so adept at crossing every T and dotting every I that not even your wife knew you may have a problem until you outright collapsed on stage. Did you suspect a drug problem? Honestly, uh, I didn't really suspect and catch on until, um, until uh, just before I filed for divorce. You know, there was just an occasion, an incident where he had collapsed mm -hmm. and he was in the hospital. This is during the HBO? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This was an appearance he was supposed to make. Yeah. And, and now it's time to apply that canny tactical acuity. You want to buttfuck a kid. You have a choice of time and location. 
a cavernous, sprawling Neverland estate with countless winding corridors and cozy hidden rooms and compartments away from prying eyes, replete with security guards, a silent alarm system, and a secret fireplace exit? I was in his room of accomplishments, looking at his platinums, and then I turned around and I seen a chess set. It was platinum and gold. <laughs> And I did not know because I thought I came in the one door, which is the only way in and the only way out. But didn't know that he had a secret door from the fireplace that was a fake fireplace. Wow. It was a door. He came in that door, and it's so quiet. I thought, you know, when you hear doors, you hear no, no sound. So he came behind me and put his hand on my shoulder, and I fell to my feet. He started busting out laughing at me. Or a five-star European hotel you've been photographed at with the child while a bodyguard is present and while suffering from the fucking flu. So why did no one stop him? Not the police, not Geordie's mother, and not Jackson's manager. In the suite of the awards, uh, Geordie and Michael were in there with flu. I got the doctor to come. They said they had the flu, so to get a doctor. And the mother and daughter went out shopping to Italy. And they were in the in the suite with the flu. I don't know about you, but nothing brings my apathetic crank to full fucking attention like nasal phlegm and 100 degree fevers. I mean, if, if Michael had been so inclined, and he wasn't, folks, he basically had a ready-made pedo chateau at Neverland, and the Chandlers want us all to believe he decided to bone the kid on foreign soil in the completely uncontrollable environs of the World Music Awards in Monaco while they were both miserably ill and not one fucking day after Michael Jackson was photographed with the accused and his sister bouncing on his butt fucking lap. It more than strains credulity, people. It obliterates it, annihilates it, bends it over the mantle and spanks it harder than a porn star with daddy issues. Oh, into the walking pair of crow's feet in the documentary flapping her spray tan jowls about Michael bouncing Jordan Chandler up and down on his lap. He was bouncing Jordy up and down on his lap. His nickname for the boy was Rubba. Whispering rubber, rubber. Yeah, well, unless Jordan Chandler got a Jean Benet makeover, that appears to be his sister bouncing up and down on Michael's lap. And so long as we're correcting flagrant factual errors, Bob Jones was never Michael Jackson's manager. He was a fucking publicist. Yet this documentary erred with this ceaseless procession of screaming circumstantial inaccuracies uncut from the broadcast with nary a toffee-nosed twat at Channel 4 in the UK so much as raising a bushy brow at something publicly available footage proves was a bald face fucking lie. Are you beginning to better understand the daisy chain of disinformation plucked from the tabloid press playbook in effect wherever Michael Jackson is concerned? The reasons for this coverage, however, have never been mysterious. When I came to New York and asked them, to, I told them I wanted to publish a book that was going to talk about Michael Jackson not guilty. They said, we don't want anything that's pro Jackson. And I actually called even one of the publishers that I've worked with for many years and spoke to the top person there. And she said, Aphrodite, I'm sorry, we can't do anything pro Jackson. And I thought, this is wild. So in other words, the, the publishing world has decided that there will be nothing pro Jackson, even though a courtroom has exonerated this man. The media worldwide were out to get Michael Jackson. The money was in a conviction, OK? Barry Gordy, who founded Motown, told me after the acquittals that you cost the worldwide media billions by those not guilty verdicts because the kind of copy that his being convicted, remanded to jail, the build up to a sentencing, which would have been the biggest sentencing in world history, was something they wanted. You know, this was big, big business. They were doing everything they could to spin a conviction. No one said, oh my goodness, we're sorry. We reported all the wrong things. Let's make the record straight now. No. In fact, they ignored the not guilty verdicts and the paparazzi went right into, oh, we think he might have molested another boy or wow, somebody else came out of the woodwork. All these things were later found to be untrue, but they make great headlines on the cover of rag papers and cell tabloids. 
The media has a habit of building its heroes, all but erecting monuments to their splendor, harvesting a monetary windfall from their rise, and then, often at a perfectly arbitrary point of their choosing, they take a sledgehammer to the very same, profiting by their Pompeian downfall thereby. From the great Britney Spears parasol rampage of 2007, to the Amanda Bynes batshit barrage, the only thing the media loves more than an idol is a fallen one. And for those arguing that the presence of the aforementioned alarm system is a portent to pedophilia, consider for a moment how deeply paranoid Michael Jackson had become by this point. Michael confided to everyone from friends to his then-wife Lisa Marie Presley that he believed Sony were actively trying to have him assassinated for half of his ownership in the company. And then the final part of the conversation was him uh, telling me that he felt that, um, that someone was going to try and kill him to get a hold of his catalog and his, his estate. And I really didn't know what to do with that. Something that given the Japanese vultures picking the King of Pop's corpse clean in the aftermath is looking less and less paranoid by the microsecond. As Lisa Marie and Jackson family members have alleged, he also engaged in illicit drug use during this period, largely stemming from serious burns he sustained during a Pepsi commercial in the 1980s. We just listened to Teddy Riley describe a platinum chess set in his duplex-sized bedroom. Are you honestly contending that a silent alarm system and a secret entrance is not a fairly mild expression? of the King of Pop's proven paranoia? Ah, but what of the sleeping with young boys allegations? Well, let's place this once again in its appropriate context. The prosecution never said Michael sleeps in the same bed as young boys, although that in and itself wouldn't connote pedophilia either. They said he sleeps in the same room as young boys. The problem? Michael Jackson's bedroom was the size of a fucking duplex! Well, first of all, Larry, this notion that he sleeps with boys was a concoction by the prosecution. What he said very openly was that he allows families into his room. Now, his room is the size of a duplex. It's two levels. He's had mothers sleep there, fathers sleep there, sisters sleep there, brothers sleep there. The prosecution concocted this little saying about sleeping with boys because they thought it would turn off the jury, and they failed. Look, saying Michael Jackson sleeps in the same room as boys is like saying I slept in the same room as my dad growing up because we were all in the same house. This is not uncommon in people who purchase mansions, by the by. To isolate one section of the estate off to yourself and essentially live out of that exclusively, rarely if ever venturing to any other rooms in a mansion aside from special occasions. This harkens back to the Paleolithic underpinnings of our cave-dwelling ancestors. Roman columns are bitchin' and all, but all the human brain really wants at the end of the day is a nice cozy cave replete with meat and heat. So yeah, boys slept in Michael Jackson's two-story fucking room. So did their parents. So did entire fucking families when they were staying there. But if there's one cause for skepticism where Michael's innocence is concerned that I can actually relate to, it's with the decision to settle the Jordan Chandler case out of court for a reputed $20 million. So why in the fuck did Michael Jackson pay $20 million to cover up a crime I and many other reasonable human beings thoroughly believe he never committed? Mr. Jackson had entered into that settlement uh, because business, and business advisors told him to. They weren't writing the check. They wanted to get him to get going in his business life and stop being derailed by this, this very salacious legal proceeding and that he regretted doing it. It's interesting because that settlement money, which is around the ballpark of $20 million, is something that never leaves people's minds. It seems as though that will always continue to be a controversial aspect in the legacy of Michael Jackson. Well, remember, he was a billionaire. And this person had money-making opportunities around the world that were endless. Uh, this was someone who could wake up in the morning, decide to go to any capital in the world, and make millions of dollars if he wanted to. So the amount of money he paid was nothing compared to what he was worth and what he could earn. And the people around him said, Michael, write the check, get rid of the case, let's move on. We have so many business opportunities everywhere, on every continent, and that's what he did. And it came back to haunt him, unfortunately. I think it was the wrong advice. I think he should have fought it and won. The media is more than willing to tell us all that Michael Jackson paid out 20 million to Jordan Chandler and a mill apiece to his parents. What they seem almost habitually unwilling to provide is fucking context for that act. You see, the Chandlers, acting on advice from their shyster shitbag Larry Feldman, deliberately waited to level charges for several months until Michael Jackson had begun his tour for the Dangerous album. The tour was split up into two legs, with a brief respite for recuperation in between. And this 
was no fucking accident. What this did is immediately press Michael Jackson toward a very difficult no-win choice. Either fight the allegations in court, canceling the second leg of his first major tour under the Sony banner, pissing off both his record company, concert promoter, lawyers, and fans in the process, and engaging in a trial that, while I'm firmly convinced would have cleared him ultimately of wrongdoing, would have also been a deeply dehumanizing and embarrassing one for the self-conscious pop star regardless. Why dehumanizing and embarrassing, you ask? Well, anyone like myself in their late 20s, early 30s remembers the following newsreel footage with crystal fucking clarity. I have been forced to submit to a dehumanizing and humiliating examination by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department earlier this week. They served a search warrant on me which allowed them to view and photograph my body including my penis, my buttocks, my lower torso, thighs, and any other error that they wanted. They were supposedly looking for any discoloration, spotting, blotches, or other evidence of a skin color disorder called vitiligo, which I have previously spoken about. So the police took PP Polaroids of one of the most self-conscious and insecure individuals on planet Earth and threatened to pass him around a courtroom in an effort to determine whether the accuser correctly identified Jacko's Johnson. Incidentally, he didn't. How do we know this? Because the Chandler family during the pretrial phase purposefully omitted them from evidence without of course informing Michael Jackson who at this point was already being pressured to settle by everyone from Sony with whom he just inked the most lucrative recording contract in history and who fully expected a return on said investment the concert promoters for his first major tour in support of Dangerous and as Jackson's attorney during the 2005 case has since confirmed his settlement happy legal team as fucking well okay, and Howard Weitzman have always acted in uh, what they believed were Michael Jackson's best interests. And I believe that uh, they thought those settlements were the best result for Michael, that they wanted to keep him out of a courtroom and let him do his music and his, uh, his performance art, uh, get him away from the lawyers. I understand that completely. Unfortunately, I think the decision to settle those cases was a disaster. And I think the settlements opened Pandora's box and resulted in his criminal case in 2004-2005, uh, as well as the current Wade Robson, Jimmy Safechuck civil cases. Would they change their opinions about what happened? They appear to have completely changed their memory of the facts and are seeking money. I don't have great faith that Mr. Weitzman and Mr. Branco will try these cases effectively in front of a judge or jury. My guess is that if a judge does not throw these cases out, that there'll be a settlement and that money will be paid by the estate. I hope that doesn't happen, but my guess is that Mr. Branca and Mr. Weitzman do not want and defend. That's my guess. I don't know. I'm not in their minds that this case go to a public trial. And unfortunately, Robson and Safechuck's lawyers know that. They know they're being opposed by some lawyers with a history of being involved with Michael Jackson when he settled cases. So if he goes to trial, sure, MJ would have been cleared. As we've already established, the evidence against him was laughable. It literally did not exist. In fact, we know this evidence is weak because much of it was used in the 2005 case and was promptly laughed the fuck out of court. Anyone who followed the case knew about the issue of 1108 evidence, which in California is called prior bad acts evidence. And what, the process, what California allows and few states do allow is that in a case like this, you can bring in evidence of other alleged similar acts, even if they were never charged with a crime, and even if they're not the essence of the charge in this particular case. So what they said in their opening statement was, we have evidence that five young men were molested, and we're going to present all of that to you. And to make it even worse, it appeared, the judge did something I've never seen happen in a case like this, with respect to three of those alleged five victims, he allowed witnesses to come in and say they saw them molested without the prosecution having to bring the actual alleged victims in. They put on three guards who had worked at Neverland to say they saw these three people molested. One of them, Macaulay Culkin, okay, the actor, all right? Now, those three guards had sued Michael Jackson claiming that he wrongfully terminated them. He had cross-complained saying that they had stolen property from him. It was the longest civil trial in the history of Santa Maria. They lost their case. Jackson won his cross-complaint. 
He had a million dollar judgment against all of them. There were judicial findings of fraud against all of them. They had gone to the tabloids and sold stories. And the three people they say they saw molested, they were my first three witnesses. They came in and said they were never touched. So your options, fight, lose hundreds of millions canceling your first Sony World Tour, actively defy the legal advice of your attorneys and insurance company, engage in a court case where you have every reason to believe your vitiligo-afflicted genitals will be made a public spectacle, or the other option was to settle for $20 million. A lot to you and me, but to Michael Jackson, who at that time owned half of Sony's music publishing, is a water molecule in a drop, in a bucket, in a fucking ocean. Then continue on tour, make that money back in a single fucking night, and everyone from Sony to the concert promoter to all the people he employs during said tour go home happy, and his dong ain't dangling in front of a jury in all likelihood half the slack-jawed goddamn nation in the process. I agree, it was a stupid decision. And incidentally, by the end, so did Michael. But it doesn't make him a pedophile. It makes him a deeply non-confrontational cat being pressured from all sides by disparate multi-million dollar conglomerates who stood to lose a fuck of a lot of money but whose self-respect and reputation were left mercifully off the chopping block in the process while Michael was left to twist in the wind as if I needed another reason to hate the shit out of Sony. In the aftermath, Jordan Chandler was actually emancipated from both of his parents, took his money, fucked off off to the Hollywood Hills and never spoke to them again. He was given a chance to testify in the 2005 case, incidentally, but when he saw how easily the other witnesses crumbled under cross-examination... I have to tell you, I've never seen so many witnesses provide so much salacious, disturbing testimony, and I've never seen so many witnesses crumble so quickly under cross-examination. I'll probably never see it again. I mean, it almost became a circus. Uh, people would get on that stand and say they'd seen the most horrific things on the planet. Uh, there would be a, just a heavy atmosphere in the courtroom. So you, you could almost cut the silence with a knife after they were finished. And on cross-examination, they would just splatter. He conveniently decided not to show. Curious tactics if you're convinced Michael Jackson is a hardened pedophile. Michael Jackson did not fuck Kids, it does not conform to logic. It does not conform to the facts. This fiction persists in full view of contradictory timetable evidence. And when brought before a jury in 2005, as much of the evidence from 1993 was, Michael was not only exonerated, but in a trial scheduled for between six to eight months, he was acquitted in less than five. He didn't barely scrape on by. He was vindicated fucking resoundingly. And as for the so-called additional accusers, you may be interested to note that they were all disproved proven categorically in court in 2005 due to the aforementioned ludicrous legal statute in California permitting evidence of prior acts often through third-party hearsay as such the prosecution made a miserable attempt to pin Michael to the molestation of five other boys we started our case with three of those five young men who they claim were molested and they all said he never touched me that's how we began our case three of the five the fourth one never showed up, and if he had, I think we were armed pretty well to deal with him, and that's Larry Feldman's client. There are a lot of other issues that go into that case that I don't have time to talk about, but let's just say that I had a lot of information to go after him on, uh, not to mention the profit motive. Why do you take money and not go to the police and prosecute, particularly, you know, if you're a family member, do you prefer to take money instead of having police, or police and prosecutors go after you criminally? What does that tell you about the situation? The fifth young man was a so-called youth pastor who claimed he'd been tickled by Michael Jackson outside of his genes and needed five years worth of therapy to deal with his trauma. And by the way, he wanted millions of dollars, his mother wanted it, and his mother also sold story to the tabloids. Now, if I'm into kitty fucking, am I crazy? Or is Macaulay Culkin in the early 90s not my Cindy Crawford. I mean, look at the kid. He's goddamn adorable. Or for that matter, a young Corey Feldman, at least one of whom was molested by powerful people in Hollywood and was not shy about admitting it. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old. Surrounded. Literally. Didn't even know it. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me till I went, oh my God, they were everywhere like vultures. Vultures who Feldman says abused him and his best friend, the late child actor Corey Haim. 
Michael Jackson was a witch hunt, okay? Let me just say this. He was a guy who was so innocent, so kind of sheltered, you couldn't even swear around him. You couldn't talk about drugs. You couldn't talk about nude women. You couldn't talk about sex. You couldn't talk about anything. And if a couple troglodytic pants shitting bodyguards who were actively suing Michael Jackson for wrongful termination at the time and wound up not only losing, but found guilty of stealing from the King of Pop are considered credible witnesses as to Michael's sexuality, well, all right, accepting the batshit premise that security guard testimony is mana from heaven, let's talk to some goddamn bodyguards about Michael's sexuality. Was he a pedophile? No, no, we don't believe so. I don't believe so. Not at all. Being a father myself and being a man, men know men. He had the desires of women like we did. In fact, they say he had at least two girlfriends, dispelling that other rumor. We had a, uh, a curtain in the, that covered the back seat. You couldn't see in the back seat. They talked back there and, you know. So he's making out in the back seat? Or chewing loud gum. And talking to L.A. Reid, and in talking to Teddy Riley, guys who spent a lot of time with him, they both told me stories about these women in the studio. Okay, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. I was, I was, you know, everyone has their perceptions of what Michael was about. But I tell you what, L.A. Reid is a guy I know very well. I know Teddy Riley very well. These are very straight guys. And they're, te they, they're telling me that when Michael had fine-ass women in the studio hanging out with him. I believe him. So it's interesting that there's this whole narrative about Michael as a heterosexual male. Hanging out with guys I know who are very heterosexual male. But there was, there was it's something interesting. He himself would never consciously, publicly, it was like he had this well, interesting I mean, that, thing. That, I mean so, that's your foolproof 1993 molestation case, folks. The one every blathering asshat in the country seems to believe was accurate. Not so much ironclad as tin-plated, isn't it? If you buy that shit as airtight, I got a Swiss cheese submarine I think you might be interested in. And one last parting shot for review tech. Hey, Richie boy, know what's even better than common sense? Fucking research! Razor fist, out! <laughs>